Sunday night discussion class. Um, everybody's been here, so you know what um, what's going on at the lodge and when it's going on. There's going to be a uh, today. We'll do a short talk and some reading, and hopefully some questions out of that. The this, the talk for today, the, the topic was the guardian wall, and as everyone may or may not know, most people I'm sure know, for those that don't know, the guardian wall is a phrase or a term that comes out of the voice of the silence. In the third fragment, um, it's mentioned that after a long series of perfections, relative perfections, an adept becomes one of those members of the guardian wall. And I've taken some excerpts out of, uh, out of The Voice um, and out of an article by HPB and out of The Secret Doctrine. But before we get into it, they're pretty lengthy. I don't know if we'll re get through all of them. But the, the idea, we all get the, the, the concept of a wall. Walls not only keep things out, they protect what's inside of them. And so whether it's a fortress, whether it's the wall of a cell, whether it's your skin, there's, there's a certain barrier there, but it's not a definite barrier. Your skin protects you from a certain amount of things, but things can get through your skin. There's bacteria on your skin that works like defenses to keep certain other bacteria out, but things can get into the skin. A cell wall is made to be permeable to let what is supposed to come inside the wall in and what needs to be expelled from the wall or radiated from the cell, from the nucleus, out. So in a sense, we can start with that idea of a guardian wall, that it's guarding two things. It's serving as a protection, holding back a certain amount of whatever it's holding, and also blocking from something entering into what the wall is protecting. Now, it's, it's said in the teachings that we all have a, a physical nature that we see, an animal physical nature. And that nature is an electromagnetic skeleton under which that nature is attached to. But the skeleton, unlike the the skeleton of a building, let's say, where everything that is the skeleton of the building is covered, your astral body permeates outside of your physical building, your body. So it's, it's your first defense as far as a wall goes. We don't see it. If we were a little bit psychic, or a little bit of an intuitive seer, we might see people's astral shell, which is protecting their physical shell from things coming in. We've all watched horror movies where someone's possessed. Whether that's a reality or not a reality, it's for your own to, thoughts to think about. But for someone to be possessed, something has to get within that physical body. To get within the physical, it has to permeate through the astral. And HPB, the Masters, William Q. Judge, they all make the statement that our attitude and our motive is a key factor in all the aspects of life. What your motive is going to motivate you to what actions you're going to take. And your attitude and your motive, without us necessarily aware of it, causes our astral shell to work as a force field magnetically to repel certain influences. We've all seen the physical effects of a magnet. If you have a magnet, two opposite poles, they'll pull together. Two opposite poles will attract. If you have two of the same poles, depending on the strength of the magnet and you, you might never be able to put those two together because they're expelling and they're radiating something out which keeps the other from attaching to it. 
And so in a sense, we can say that walls work in, in different ways. And in a sense, the guardian wall, we, I think it's, it's good to think about what it is that a master does to create this wall. Are they physically tied hand in hand to block whatever might be coming from inside and want to, there's a few ideas of what might happen. I mean, we could say the master is working as a guardian wall to protect humanity from effects that humanity takes. We, and we all see the, the resulting effects on the physical plane of human thought. War is an effect of human thought. <coughs> Poverty is an effect of human thought. Not just of those who are poor, but of those who aren't poor. And are they going to do something about it? Are they going to address it as a problem? Is it a social problem? A personal problem? Or is it individual problems? That's all affected by our thoughts and our attitudes. If they can affect the attitudes of mankind, they're going to affect the results that happen on the physical plane. And it's said that action on a, on a spiritual plane is stronger than action on a physical plane. Action on an astral plane is stronger than action taken on a physical plane. And you might want to think about it if, 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 if you have an emotion. An emotion is really an astral plane effect or originator. It either starts or it's a result of, and it's on the astral plane. If someone's to come up and sock you in the arm, let's say, they're horsing around, they're going to show you or give it your attention and they sock you in the arm, you're going to feel an ouch. You might even get a bruise. If they're really super strong, they might even break your arm or dislocate it. Eventually it's going to heal. If someone inflicts mental or emotional pain on someone, that could affect them for their whole lifetime. And so it has a deeper resonance and it has a deeper effect. Which, which someone's parent might say to them when they're five, six, seven years old, or what, what they tell them and what the, the child experiences as emotion and also as factual information can affect them for the rest of their life. And then it affects the other people that they interact with. So we could say that one way the masters might work is on these planes of consciousness that are invisible, but their effects are much more powerful. I want to start off, I'm going to read these first two, well, just the, the number one on the first page of Guardian. And this is a section from The Voice of the Silence, and it has to do with what, what I think tonight's talk may be originated from. It says, The self-doomed to live through future kalpas, unthanked and unperceived by man, wedged as a stone with countless other stones, from which the guardian wall, which from which form the guardian wall. Such is thy future if the seventh gate thou passest, built by the hands of many masters of compassion, raised by their tortures, by their blood cemented, it shields mankind since man is man, protecting it from further and far greater misery and sorrow. And there is a little a footnote that went along with Guardian Wall. In that footnote, it says, The Guardian Wall, or Wall of Protection, it is taught that the accumulated efforts of long generations of yogis, saints, and adepts, especially of Nirmanakayas, have created, so to say, a wall of protection around mankind, which wall shields mankind invisibly from still worse evils. We know from theosophical teachings that karma has to play out. An adept can't interfere with your karma. They can maybe mitigate it in the sense that if, you, if there's something that you have to 
experience, they might be able to drag out that effect over a period of time. You're still, a, you're still dealing with the karma, but instead of it hitting you all in one afternoon, you might get it over six days, or six years, or maybe even a little bit longer. And I think if we all look at our individual personal experiences, there's certain events that happen in our life that we might say, oh, okay, I figured that out. I'm not going to do that again. And two years later or the next week, a similar event that basically has the same effect on you comes at you in a different way. And you say, well, I had it all figured out except for that one aspect. So now you've figured out the two aspects and, and you, you're certain it's solved. You go a little further and then wham, and it hits you twice as hard or four times as hard as the previous two. So then you think, okay, I, I see there's something that I'm mi either missing or it's a lot bigger problem than I'm realizing. But at least I had the first two to put me into training to deal with the third one because the third one was a lot more dramatic on its effect. So we can see how this might play out, how an adept might be sort of in the same way that a parent, when you're little, the parent lets you make a certain amount of mistakes. So they'll let you trip and fall on the carpet. And then you kind of get that down and then they let you trip and fall on the tile floor. So that hurts a little bit more, but you're still kind of figuring it out. So then you start walking towards the front porch in the 10 steps and they grab you by the arm and they say, okay, I'm gonna walk you down the steps and walk you back up the steps and walk you back down the steps until you get this walking figured out because the spill down the stairs might stop you from ever experiencing any more karma. And they see that and they say, okay, they need to learn the lesson, but they don't need to learn it that way or that hard. So in a sense, we could say that's possibly one way the adepts might work behind the scenes. It says that they also work within the scenes, but we might not know that a, someone's an adept. They could be come and work among mankind and people think, oh, that's a very kind person or that's a revolutionary. They changed a certain social movement. They influenced people to change the direction they were going. Maybe they come as some kind of general that's able to stop a war that's been going on for 20 years. We might recognize them as a pretty impressive person, but not necessarily recognize them as a, a, an adept that is trying to help mankind in a particular way. We could get ideas of people who might be someone like that. Maybe someone like Paracelsus that was able to do a lot of healing in ways that wasn't well, wasn't acceptable when he came around. Or other people that we've seen. Maybe someone like Gandhi that changed the course of a particular group of people. So there's various types of adepts, and we could say of various ways that they might work to form a guardian wall. In, in this talk, we're going to get into, like most theosophical subjects, it starts off with something that seems pretty straightforward and pretty basic. The adepts form a guardian wall. That makes sense. They're, they're, they're advanced humans that have gotten to the stage past the gods who were not yet human. So they're more evolved on the evolutionary scale. They're more evolved than the gods that maybe helped create and evolve the universe. So that's, that's the guardian wall. These, these perfected beings have gotten to a stage, so now they're waiting for the rest of us to catch up. But when you start reading through HPB's writings, you realize she never really writes that way. Because in a definition, she'll say, well, the guardian walls are made up with adepts. 
masters, Dion Chohans, Nirmanakayas, Bodhisattvas, and they all have names, and, and it's all it all makes sense. It's from different traditions, but then when you look, or they'll say they're similar to a, in the Christian terminology, they might be called an angel or a or a planetary spirit. So then when you look what HPB describes as a planetary spirit, then that puts a different slant on what the guardian wall might contain, what makes up the guardian wall. And when you look at what she says about planets, the guardian spirits of the planets, or the regents of the planets, or the inner nature of the planets or the stars, within a certain time frame or, or clock, now you're talking, in a sense, you're talking about astrology. But you're not talking about astrology that you're going to read in the LA Times in the newspaper. She's talking about astrology from the sense of how a cosmos comes into being, how humanity comes into being, and the interrelationship between the cosmos and humanity. And so, Let's go and read a couple of these, these statements because it's, it's interesting what she says about the planetary spirits. And another term which I see everyone here has been to a few classes. So another term that she uses when discussing this aspect are the lithica or the recorders of karma. So Linda, do you want to read number... Oh, well, let's see... Just read number two, please, on the first page. Number two. This, oh, this, oh, no, no. this shows that these presumably dead chain chubs are living bodhisattvas, or bhante, known under various names among Tibetan people, among others, Lao or spirits, as they are supposed to have an existence more in spirit than in flesh. At death, they often renounce nirvana, the bliss of eternal rest or oblivion of personality to remain in their spiritualized astral selves for the good of their disciples and humanity mm -hmm. in general. Okay, and these two excerpts are from an a article called Tibetan Teachings and it has to do with explaining um, what aspect a Nirmanakaya really is because there were some mis misunderstandings about Nirmanakayas and if they're invisible beings, are they the same as departed personalities or uh, what was being brought into seance rooms? And so she's saying, no, it's all it's completely different. Um, Vicki, you want to read number three? And that, there's those two paragraphs that go in the same article. Lawmakers believe in the indestructibility of matter as an element. They reject the immortality and even the survival of the personal self, teaching that the individual self alone, that is, the collective aggregation of the many personal selves that were represented by that one during the long series of various existences, may survive. The latter may even become eternal. The word eternity was then embracing but the period of a great cycle. Eternal in its incredible individuality, but this may be done only by becoming the unknown, a celestial Buddha, or what a Christian capitalist might call a planetary spirit, or one of the Elohim, a part of the conscious whole composed of the aggregate intelligences in their universal collectivity while nirvana is the unconscious soul. Some of them prolong their life on earth, though not to any supernatural limit. Others become Dion Chohans, a class of the planetary spirits, or Davids, who becoming, so to say, the guardian of the birth of men, are the only class out of the seven class hierarchy of spirits in our system who preserve their personality. These holy law, instead of reaping the fruit of their deeds, sacrifice themselves in the invisible world, as the Lord Sanya's Buddha did on this earth, and the name Devakon, the 
world of bliss nearest to the earth, as again from the article to them teachings. One thing that was interesting in this explanation when she's talking about the Dion Shohans, a celestial Buddha, or what a Christian Kabbalist might call a planetary spirit or a Lohan, a part of the conscious whole, distinguishing it from the unconscious whole. And if we remember reading through the, the voice of the silence, and there's a, there's a footnote that des describes a Nirmanakaya, Sambhogakaya, a Dharmakaya, and the difference that that is, we could say that the Nirmanakaya is a conscious spirit, where the other ones are in this other state, which is unconscious, or unability to, to help mankind because of their, we could say they're frozen in a state of consciousness that is not relative, it only radiates maybe radiates through a nirmanakaya. They're not participants in the sense that they're actively bringing out this intelligence because they're within the wall of nirvana. Nirvana isn't blankness, it's absolute <clears throat> selfhood. But it's not expressed in the material world except through the nirmanakaya. We could say that the the all the all the wisdom and knowledge of nirvana is only expressed in, in during a manifestation through these bodhisattvas nirmanakayas. They're the they're the wall, or like when I was talking about the cell, they're the wall of the cell that only lets out what is worthy of coming out, but they don't let in anything that's going to affect that state. The next two have to do with the planetary spirits and then the lipica. And so in a sense we could say that, well let's, well, let's read them and then we can discuss them. Shaw, you want to read for a bit? I'll read number four. There's, it's a, it's a, a couple paragraphs, but just number four, please. The planetary spirits are the informed spirits of the stars in general, and of the planet, planets especially. They rule the destinies of men who are all born under one or other of their constellations. The second and third groups pertaining to other systems have the same functions, and all rule various departments of nature. In the Hindu exoteric pantheon, they are the guardian deities who preside over the eight points of the compass, the four cardinals and the four intermediate points and are called loka elements, supporters of guardians of the world, and are visible also, of which Indra, East, Yama, South, Varuna, West, and Kuvera, North, are the chief. Their elephants and their spouses pertaining of forces to fancy and afterthought, though all of them have an opposite. The Lipika, a description of whom is given in the commentary on Stanza 4, number 6, are the spirits of the universe, whereas the builders are only our own planetary deities. The former belong to the most awful portions of cosmogenesis, which cannot be given here. Of its highest grade, one thing only is taught. The Lipika are connected with karma, being its direct reporters. A symbol for sacred and secret knowledge is universally in antiquity a tree by which a script, scripture or a record was also meant. Hence the word Lipica, the writers, or, or scribes, the dragons, the symbols of wisdom, who guard the trees of knowledge, the golden apple tree of the spirits, the luxuriant trees, and vegetation of Mount Mugu, guarded by a serpent. Juno gives to Jupiter, on her marriage with him, a tree with golden fruit is another form of Eve offering Adam, the apple from the tree of knowledge. Thanks. So in this, this section, HPB is giving us two um, explanations, one of the planetary spirits and one of the Lipica. And it's interesting where she, she says the Lipica, or the former belong to the most occult portion of cosmogenesis, 
which cannot be given here. And then I've, I've edited, I've deleted a, a lot of stuff because she goes into a bit of an explanation of that on the page reference. But saying can't be um, given up here. Of its highest grade, only one is taught. The Lipica are connected with karma, being its recorders. And if you look up the in the secret doctrine, the Lipica, there's a lot of references that go along with it. But she makes the comment that they're the scribes of karma. And in talking of the planetary spirits, she makes the, she makes the comment of how the adepts or the planetary spirits are involved with this. You could say that they're the agents of karma. The Lipica are the recorders of karma. We could say the planetary spirits, in a sense, are the agents of karma. It's said that the, the adepts don't make karma. Karma manifests through them, but they don't create new karma, which is a very strange thing to think about if you think about it, because it would seem that any being is making karma. But if they're working with the flow of karma, then they're not creating new karma, they're just, in a sense, agents of karma. If we think about, earlier I made the statement that the adepts can't change karma, they can only maybe mitigate it or create another circumstance where it plays out in a different way. The Lipica aren't going to change your karma. They're, they're making a note of it. And she, in, in number five, let me read number five as we go along. Because this is, is going, is, is another explanation of the Lipica. The esoteric meaning of the first sentence of the sloka is that those who have been called the Lipica, the recorders of the karmic ledger, make an impassable barrier between the personal ego and the impersonal self, the noumenon and the parent source of the former, hence the allegory. They circumscribe the manifested world of matter within the ring past not. This world is the symbol, objective, of the one divided into the many, on the planes of illusion, of a deity, the first, or Ika, the one. And this one is the collective aggregate or totality of the principal creators or architects of the universe. So when she's when she makes the comment that the that they're inscribing between the personal ego and the impersonal self. It would seem that there's, there might be, and she makes this statement, the ring pass not. In a sense, we could say from a personal and an individualized soul aspect, there's maybe at least two ring pass nots. The one ring pass not is very few personalities get a chance to know their individual ego or soul. We get some communication between our higher self, our individualized soul higher self, and the personality. After a series of incarnations and life experiences, we might evolve to the state where we're aware of our individual self, besides our personality. Our individual self, or our soul, an aspect of it manifests through a personality. But that's only a small aspect of it. The soul itself, our individual collection of all of our personal awareness, understanding, and experience, is the container of that. But that is only an aspect of the oversoul, or the one universal self. It's not the absolute. It's an, abs it's an abstract 
expression of the absolute. But that universal soul, we could say, on earth, the universal soul, we might say, is a planetary spirit. All life that is experiencing is contained within this oversoul. Venus has a planetary spirit. Mars has a planetary spirit. The Sun is a grand planetary spirit. And so in a sense we could say that the, the Lipica have various levels of this guardian wall. It's only good to know, from a personal standpoint, it's only good to know what your individualized soul wisdom is if you can actually use it. If you can't use it, it's not really helping you evolve. If, if, in a, in a day-to-day -day example, if, if you went to school and the teacher said, don't bother reading the book, Here's the answers, memorize the answers. So you go home and you memorize the answers and he says, there's gonna be a test on Wednesday. Did you memorize the answers? Yeah. Well, make sure you memorize the answers, but don't forget the paper with all the answers on it when you take the test. Make sure you bring that to class. So you think, okay, I'm gonna bring the answer paper to the questions and the test day. So you show up to class and the teacher says, do you have all your answer papers? And you're like, yeah, we have them. Okay, well I'm going to give you the test. And you take the test. And you have the answer paper, so you should be able to pass the test. Most of us as a personality, if we knew what our ego knew, we wouldn't have many karmic mistakes. We would still have some, because we'd be, we would only be learning from what we've already learned, plus how this, the slight change that might involve by being a personality. So in a sense, there's a, there's a guardian wall between our personality and our soul. It's said when we can get past selfishness, that more of that soul wisdom can radiate through this ring pass knot and it can pass through. And when we can operate from that individualized soul aspect, you could say that is, if not the beginning, at least a pretty advanced aspect of a, an adept. An adept that can operate as a personality from an individualized soul on this plane. If we could take it to the next step, and we could operate as an individualized soul with the full knowledge of the oversoul, then we could say that is the guardian wall that the voice of the silence is talking about. Mm -hmm. there's, a, there's a collection of experience, not just the experience from the earth evolving, but experience from all the souls from previous Evolution. In the Secret Doctrine, HPB says that before there was the Earth, there was the Moon. And all the egos and all the monads on the Earth were in some form of evolution on the Moon. Some of them got to the human state. The Moon started disintegrating and went into a pariah. The Earth was in a beginning state of forming those higher egos move through. Eventually we have a solid planet with egos that are getting experience on this planet. But those egos were from another planet. And it keeps evolving, keeps evolving. That's, that's the teaching in theosophy. So in a sense, if we can get to the state where our individualized soul is expressing just as an aspect of the universal soul, then we're one of these stones in the guardian wall. We're still operating in the in this manvantric period. We're still operating in the manifested world. And we're still collecting experience. Because as a as a 
as a spirit being, the planet is still evolving. And we're part of that evolution, even though as an adept, we're at a higher part. And I think that's, it, it puts the idea of, of a Nirmanakaya into a pretty grand position, because you're not only a agent of universal wisdom as it's manifesting in the Manvantra, but you're also connected to the evolution as it's happening from the lower grades. Pete, you want to read the next one, number six? The Hermetic philosophers called Theoi, Gauss, Genii, and Daimonis in the original text. Those entities whom we call Devas, Gauss, the Angelans, Chitgala, Kuan Yin, the Buddhist call it, and by other names. The Daimonis are, in the Socratic sense, and even in the Oriental and Latin theological sense, the guardian spirits of the human race those who dwell in the neighborhood of the immortals and thence watch over human affairs, as Hermes has it. In esoteric parlance, they are chitkala, some of which are those who have furnished man with his fourth and fifth principles from their own essence, and others the pitri, so-called. This will be explained when we come to the production of the complete man. The root of the name is Chitti, that by which the effects and consequences of actions and kinds of knowledge are selected for the use of the soul, or conscience, the inner voice in man. With the yogis, the Chitti is a synonym of Ma, the first and divine intellect. But in esoteric philosophy, Ma is the root of Chitti, its germ. And chitti is a quality of manas in conjunction with buddhi, a quality that attracts to itself by spiritual affinity a chit power when, when it develops sufficiently in man. This is why it is said that chitti is a voice acquiring mystic life and becoming kuan yin. So if we remember in this in, in this section, we, could, we consider Buddhi as that universal oversoul intelligence, and Manas as the individualized soul, or lower Manas as a personalized individualized soul. Dr. Joe, you want to read number seven? Number seven. The song of which human entity is born says they're called teaching will remain forever its thought throughout the whole cycle of its incarnations in one man memory. But this is not the astrological stuff. The latter is concerned and connected with the personality, the form, with the individuality. The angel of that star are the Dhyani Buddha will be either the guiding or simply the presiding angel, so to say, in every new birth of the monad, which is part of his own essence, though his vehicle, man, may remain forever ignorant of this fact. The adepts have each their Dhyani Buddha, their elder twin soul, and they know it, calling it Father Soul and Father Fire. It is only at the last and supreme initiation, however that they learn it when placed face to face with the bright image. How much has Wu Wang Litton known of this mystic fact? when describing in one of his highest inspiration of a mood, the knowing face to face with his our bodies. Okay, thank you. Any questions or comments? Yes, the problem is it seems like each of us each of us have 
regarding what we do, our conscience, our intuition, our aspiration. That we begin, we pay more attention to the personal rather than the regarding soul, which is reincarnation, reincarnating in angel, right. our true nature, our true self. We are the microcosm of the microcosm, indeed, aren't we? Yeah. Each of us is a little universe in miniature. We have all the different principles we study and all the things we talk about within ourselves. If we would only pay attention to it. I guess that's what meditation is for. Well, I, I think it's, it's, it's interesting when she, she talks about the voice and the silence. And if you really think when we're reading through some of these sections where it says a twin soul or that, that voice, what is that voice? Mm -hmm. That's your soul. But how much of that can you actually hear? Well, that's who we really are. Yeah. Because the personality is just a, tempor a temporary mask that we wear and identify with. Pete? When you read through these sections, you would get slightly confused here and there. <laughs> because sometimes you have the impression when she speaks of our own higher ego that um, she also speaks of the Libica, sometimes in the same sentence, or of a Chitkala, or of a Nirmanakaya, or a planetary spirit, or a, a Dhyani Buddha, or a Dhyan Chohan, or whatever you want to call it. But I, I think you could say, in a sense, she's always talking about the same thing, but in different aspects, mm -hmm. from different angles, so to speak. Which to us is extremely confusing, of mm -hmm. course. Not to mention that everything she sums up in different religions and philosophies has different names, too. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Well, this brings us in its name dimension, though I stepped out and um, this brings us to the challenge not to name forces but to try to get a sense of what their function is and, and Crosby comments on the Lipica uh, and reminds us that they're not outside little men on you know, huh. beards writing down in their books frantically they're an aspect of, of as, as a one of the previous students mentioned, they're aspects of our own nature. So we ourselves are our own recording energy, so to say. And we carry that with us in our universe. And I think that brings us to a, an interesting aspect in, in world folklore, where in many cultures there's a, a place in which the befuddled hero or heroine has to do a lot of sorting of materials. A lot of seeds are jumbled together and Mother Nature says, sort these out by, by dawn. Uh, or there are all sorts of tasks that have to do with, with this sorting function. And in listening to the talk and reading the, the selections, what comes to mind is that we don't think of meditation or looking with inward as sorting. But in a sense, we're sorting the different planes of our own nature and then hopefully focusing on that part of our nature which is not yet clear to us, which is our spiritual nature. Yeah. So how to go from the plane of the unsorted to the sorted? or whatever, however we want to see it, and remind ourselves that our evolution right now is to go from one sense of identity, which is incomplete, to a, a deeper and broader reality that we really are. And I think this brings that out very clearly. Yeah, I think with the with the two comments, one, one thing that to keep in mind is HPB is, is really faced with a daunting task in that she, she's trying to bring information from the subjective world to our objective thinking. And she's using 
terms from many different teachings, from different philosophies, different religions, different cultures, to try and get that idea across. And if we, and so she has to use names. And then she used a description with the name. But that description in the name is, is always in context. And in a sense, we, we deal with, that's how we deal with things, but we don't, we don't always realize it. So she's doing the same thing that we do trying to understand a person. You know someone, and that person is your friend. But to someone else, that person is their mom. And to someone else, that person is the vice president of their company, who's also a mom and also your friend, but also a sister to someone else, and an ex-lover to someone else, and the landlord to someone else. It's all the same person. Each person is kind of doing similar things, but the function and the expression of it is different. And I think that's why HPV uses a lot of different names. One is she's trying to be as, as universal so that if someone is reading this in a particular culture, they can understand it. And if we're reading it in our culture, we can understand it. If Whatever the name is, no matter what country you go to, if you say mom in their language, they have an idea of what that relationship is and what the expression is. It's going to vary depending on the culture. But a mom acts different than a vice president. And I think that's, what, that's one thing to keep in mind when we're doing all these studies of HPB's teaching. She has to give us a word to get an understanding and to discuss it with each other. But on a, the inner plane, as, as what was said, there's a truth behind that, that the word isn't. And that that expression, all the, if you collected all the names for a particular person, their personal name, their, all their family relationships, the person is still more than all those names. But subjectively, if we were on that plane, there's an aspect where we don't have to name it because it's our experience. And that's, it seems, what the Buddhic nature is, the universal soul. I don't, have to, I don't have to know your experience. It's my experience. On this plane, we see different people in different bodies. But we know that that body is made up of however many cells and other organisms, viruses and bacteria and some of those cells are destroying cells that aren't so good, and other cells are manipulating cells that are really good, and they're trying to take over. All that's going on, we're just moving around in them. But if we could see from a, a higher aspect, we're just like those cells. Each person has an individual expression personally, but they have a, a bigger expression universally. Humanity is a, is a certain collection of personal thoughts and beings. But that's only an aspect of humanity. It's also the adepts that are beyond our plane and all of thinking beings that were human throughout history. And so I think it's, we have very, we have many guardian walls. But at some point, there's the one guardian wall where we don't know or get up to the absolute. Everything else is radiated through this line of adepts. No more hands? I was wondering as we talked, looking at the personality we see that it is quite protean. Then we look at the individuality, and you wonder if there's a correspondence between the personality and the individuality, so far as the personality is giving rise 
of permitting the individuality to express itself through. In other words, do the two correspond? They correspond very closely. I think they would they would correspond better and better the more we could merge our personality into the individuality. And that might be what an adept is, is a fully integrated personality. Did you have your hand up earlier, Ross? Earlier, I was thinking about the living. And they're basically elemental, highly high-grade elemental to retain the impression of humanity, each individual humanity, and <clears throat> that's our karma. It would seem to me they're, they're part of us. <laughs> we like to think of the little men who go around jumping down, you know, your good deeds, bad deeds. I'm one of those angels, you know, the, right. my good angels. And we write down the good stuff and the bad angels. Get me in trouble all the time. <laughs> So anyway, elementals can be looked upon as angels if we understand the interpretation. Right. Pete? Yeah, well, they're number seven there, the star under which a human entity is born. It says the occult teaching will remain forever its star throughout the whole cycle of its incarnations in mm -hmm. one banter. That's saying everything without saying anything at all, of course. Mm -hmm. Because it doesn't say how long that Manvantara is. Mm -hmm. And Manvantara can be around, it can be a planetary Manvantara, a solar Manvantara, it can be a life of Brahma. <laughs> There's a big difference between one seventh of a day of Brahma and the whole life of Brahma. And then she says, this is not his astrological star, because that's different. If in your next life you're born in April, and the the life after you may be born in December, so you have a different astrological star. But here it's the same throughout all your incarnations. And then it says, the angel of that star, or the Dhyani Buddha, so the Dhyani Buddha is the angel of that star. What is the star then? Is the angel higher than the star, or is it lower than the star? Do we have any idea on that? What is an angel of a star? What is a star? Yeah, that's a good question too. That's implied in my question. <laughs> well, the, well, the stuff that is the star stuff is the angel of that star. No. Let's read the number yeah, eight. Why. Let's read How number eight. Long. Who has it read? You want to read, Church? Sure. Can you read loud? <laughs> For Dr. Joe? I see he's already on the edge of his seat, so. <laughs> It is then the seven sons of light, called after their planets and by the rebel, often identified with them, namely Saturn, Jupiter, Mercury, Mars, Venus, and presumably for the modern critic who goes no deeper than the surface of old religions, the sun and moon, which are, according to the occult teachings, our heavenly parents or father, synthetically. Hence, as already remarked, polytheism, is really more philosophical and correct as to fact and nature than anthropomorphic monotheism. Saturn, Jupiter, Mercury, and Venus, the four exoteric planets, and the three others, which must remain unnamed, were the heavenly bodies in direct astral and psychic communication with the Earth, its guides and watchers, morally and physically, the visible orbs furnishing our humanity with its outward and inward characteristics and their regents or rectors with our monads and spiritual faculties. Thanks. I guess one way to look at the, the both questions, Pete and, and Rob's questions and comments, in one sense the, the star is our is our soul, our individualized soul. And our personalities are radiations of that. But it's it's said that we are not, we don't live separately. And it's said that that things work in a hierarchical fu function. That Buddhi is the universal oversoul. 
But that universal oversoul has various aspects of expression, and it's going to express differently through different souls, different people, or different planets. If, in a sense, if we could say, what is the what is the star of our system? It's the sun. We know the sun is the, is the star, or we could say that the, the, the one of our whole system. And then Mercury and Venus and Earth are all aspects of that system. And there's other aspects within our system. But each is expressing in a particular way. And from this section, this reading we just went through, each, each center, Mercury, let's say, has an oversoul. And the Mercury oversoul is going to be different than the Venus oversoul. And that oversoul is the collection of the intelligence that's expressing through that center. So, it, it's it's said in I, I don't think I I uh, brought this reference because we're already into four pages, but it's said that it's each being for a whole man mantra, as pointed out from Pete in the reading, from a whole man mantra is connected to a particular function. Whatever we name it, they're in a particular function. And their experience is going to be varied. But they're, they're part of that collective that is functioning in a, in a very specific way. When we go to the stanza that talks about the initial seven, seven rays or seven manifestations, and those seven then start splitting and dividing and dividing and dividing. And eventually we get people on Earth. But whatever that one personality on Earth, it's linked to a very specific hierarchy, however we want to look at it. Brown brought up the idea about elementals. And we could say from a, from a different perspective, to bring it from a super cosmic perspective down to a personal aspect of it, each personality is living for a certain amount of time as a personality. And they're making thoughts and actions and eating food and building body cells and losing body cells and eventually we die. In that process, we're making impressions on elementals. And some of those impressions we make pretty regularly and they become a habit. And some of those habits become so ingrained they become a character. And some characters are so ingrained they become hard-headed characters. <laughs> and then we die. And it's said that when we come back around we're born into a, a new baby body and we have to start all over again how to function in a, in a body. But those characteristics that we just left off, however long ago that previous life was comes through. And even in a baby we see it. Some babies come through and they're nice pleasant little babies. Some babies come through and right from the get-go they're hard-headed and they're very determined and they're going to do their own thing and they get frustrated very easily. They can't move their arms and they get frustrated. Then they work out moving their arms and they can't have speech but they're super frustrated because they know what they want to do but they can't tell you what they want to do. And so in a sense, those elementals have been carried over again and again. Or maybe they come through and they're a genius. They go into their mom's living room or they go to their grandma's house, there's a piano. They climb up on the bench and start playing the piano. Obviously that had to come from somewhere. So we're back to elementals and impressing these lives but it's a collection and so in a sense we could say maybe these hierarchies express in a certain way 
there's certain bundles of tendency that it brought over that have to manifest through on a more grand scale than the difference between a personality and the individuality. Pete. This whole um, doctrine of um, the guardian wall seems to apply in, in a correspondential way then. Because just like our atmosphere, for instance, of the Earth, protects us from solar flares, for instance, up to a certain point, and we see the effects as the aurora borealis and the aurora australis in the south. Yeah. But now, science has discovered with their voyagers finally penetrating through the edge of the solar system that our solar system in turn is sort of protected like an egg or a shell, you could say, from, uh, not from solar winds then, but from cosmic winds that originate from the galaxy itself. So there seems to be like a cascading correspondence going on there in terms of guarding walls, because it must exist for the whole solar system too. And maybe for the whole galaxy, there's maybe extra galactic winds or something. Or, or flares that protect the galaxy in turn then again. So each time we are uh, confronted with hierarchies on higher and higher planes, so to speak. So, but if we turn it around, then sometimes it's not always clear whether HPV is speaking of a planetary protection or of an individual protection of the individual like the diamond that is spoken of here by Socrates, was his own protector, that was his own angel, his own guardian angel. That's why he was involved in, in a war, for instance. He would go in a trance, and even the enemy wouldn't touch him. He would walk around him and let him trance out. <laughs> uh, I, yeah, I was also thinking, uh, hearing the conversation here, that Maybe the guardian wall is a state of consciousness with innumerable degrees, and that each one of us has a degree of that state of consciousness within us. And when we live accordingly, in an unselfish, altruistic way, we activate that state of consciousness within ourselves and contribute to that guardian wall. Mm -hmm. yeah. Vicky? And along with that, goes your statement, uh, teaching said, there are those individuals who are unconscious, like they're, they're certainly not setting out to do it, but again, from past lifetimes and unselfish choices, can, can provide a protection to people they're with. And, and we perhaps have known that there were people that we sense an, an innate unconscious goodness in them. And, we, and the opposite is true, too, where you meet someone and they die. You know, yeah. don't want to be in that person's uh, presence. So to think of these as inner states goes back to um, last week's presentation on emanations, where we're, we don't see ourselves as beings that are unconsciously emanating as the universe emanates. But because we are that universe in manifestation, we're again emanating our own protection and not just selfishly, but the protection for everyone. And that might bring us back to, to motive in terms of self-examination and, and, um, and meditation, concentration, how we, are we doing it just to gain some sort of spiritual attainment? Or are we consciously working for the, the welfare of all? And it shifts the, the polarity, so to say, I think in a, in a very, um, very gentle but also very useful way. It would seem that the discussion tonight has brought most of us to a level of increased reasoning enlightenment. For instance, uh, may I impress it and say that I have wondered about the stars, but it does not seem reasonable that we're talking about a different star, but we're talking about the one star 
but the different constituents of intelligence under or uh, in uh, constitute that star. Uh, not, it seems that it is seven if we consider the zodiac, We're talking about the personality, the personal star. But there must be uh, more than seven hierarchies of these uh, Dionys, maybe 10, maybe 12. And it would seem that in talking about the personal star, we are talking about these, if you want to call them levels of Dionys, that obviously we relate directly to personality. And if we want to talk about individuality, we must be talking also about a country of these uh, hierarchical Dionys. And in terms of the responses in different degrees, because you referred previously to the idea that the guardian wall, uh, you could say, is more than one layer, so to, so to speak. And we see that on, even on the physical plane, our immediate guardian is actually the mother from the very first, because she protects you in the womb. Mm -hmm. But then when you manifest, there is a father added, that together the mother and the father form the guardian wall of the child. Beyond that is the immediate family, so to speak, that forms a guardian wall for the mother and the father and the child. Be if you go beyond that, there's probably many intermediate degrees, but then ultimately you have your, your own nation or state in which you live, which is supposed to protect you. Now we have treaties among, among countries like uh, the European community, so you have a guardian wall on that level, and then maybe beyond that a continent, <coughs> and then the world as such. So even on the physical plane, we see those capacities reflected. But I was also wondering, we also know such a thing as a godfather and godmother. Would there be something corresponding here with regard to the Chitkala? Because why would you attract a Chitkala that seems to somehow be <coughs> referred to as somehow being foreign to you, or not your direct mother or father? So you can attract a Chitkala, any Chitkala? Well, Which is near Manakaya, by the way. Right. It would seem from the, from the, you know, both Vicky, your comment, Ava's comment, the universe can't be tricked. On the physical plane, we can trick each other, and we can even trick the legal system. Mm -hmm. A lot. A lot. And it happens all the time. We even recognize the legal system tricking itself. But the universe can't be tricked. And the, the keys, let's say, as, as, as the Voice of the Silence talks about, the keys to the universe are states of consciousness. Because those states of consciousness change your magnetic polarity. And your magnetic polarity is what opens your mind up to other vistas. Even by even on this plane, if you just don't have such fixed ideas, you're able to get understanding from other people's experiences and their explanations and their life stories. But by changing your inside mental polarity, which we think we do, but we're only kind of tricking ourselves most of the time. Otherwise, this wall between the inner self and the personality would be more permeable. We would get very direct intuitive dreams, let's say, instead of confused crazy dreams that don't make a lot of sense. Or we would get insights in our daily life it would come through when we needed them, and we would recognize them as being insights as opposed to being doubts or suspicions or, you know, not really logical. And so I think that's, that gets back to the point. How do we attract a godfather, let's say, on a, on a cult sense? And 
the, in the master, HBB talked about it, Judge, and the, the masters talked about it when they were corresponding with Sinet. They, they said, we, we can, we're trying to get this information to you, but we can only give you so much. They were working on this plane as a first line of defense guarding wall. We're going to get some of the information that, that we have out to the Western world, and you're going to be the agent for it. And here are the conditions. And then every once in a while in the letter they would say, we know that you're... Your intentions are good, but we know also that you're thinking this, 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 and this. Which must have been strange to get a letter from someone you never met, and they're telling you how you think. So that at least that at least should get your attention, if nothing else. You should say, well, obviously these people know a little more than I think they know. So I should pay attention to what they're saying. But they also made the comment that if... if you can ask the white questions, we can't deny you the answer. And if you can understand what we're telling you from these certain teachings and absorb it and ask questions, then we can tell you more. And if you absorb that, then we can tell you more. And they said, if you make a certain pledge or promise that you will only give out what we say is okay to give out, we can give you more to help with your understanding. But we can't help you any more without that pledge because we know that your thinking is whatever you get, you're going to give out because that's what humanity needs. And so they were working as, as this permeable guardian wall for the rest of humanity. And we can see that you know some people might read through that and think, wow, that's really kind of suspicious. I mean, I'm only going to get what you say is okay for me to give out. That's kind of suspicious. But if someone's giving you a, a, a chemistry class and they say, if you put these three elements together, you're going to have a, it'll make a stink bomb. It's going to smell like rotten eggs and it'll hold and you, you know, wherever you set it, it's going to be really smelly. You put these elements together, you, you can blow up the science class. Most teachers aren't going to tell you how to blow up the science <coughs> class. They might teach you how to make a stink bomb and see if you actually make it and then what you do with it. And then determine, okay, well, that's it for your chemistry lesson. <laughs> and that's kind of the, the, the place that the masters were kind of put in. It's our mental states that open up vistas to deeper mental states and more experience and more information. Marguerite, you had there. Uh, what I, uh, what I was going to say was related to what we were discussing at the time, and it is that I have my lunch at the senior center in Santa Monica because they allow us to come to have the lunch if we are over 60, so I qualify for that. And it's very interesting to see the large amount of dislikes that there is within that center. I didn't even see, let's say, at the lower schools, kindergarten, or primary school. At this center, people over 60, you do see a tremendous amount of dislikes. Yeah. Which dislikes. Is, kind of She's saying, interesting to see this. Yeah. She was saying that being a teacher and dealing with young kids, kindergartners, first graders, and you go to the lunchroom. And now she goes to the senior center. And at the senior center, there's more dislikes among the seniors than the that she ever saw with the elementary school kids. And it does So there's there's her relating to scandas and elementals and crystallizing. That's I tell of this sector of the age. Yeah. Um, the last one, number nine, um, you guys can re read it on your own, but let me, it, it's, it's really a, it's one of those sections that's italicized in the secret doctrine, and so it's, it, you, we should pay extra attention to it, and it has to go along with the, the planets and the stars. I'm going to read the first paragraph and the last paragraph, and I'll leave you on your own uh, guardian conscience to read the rest. 
<laughs> Every world has its parent star and sister planet. Thus, Earth is the adopted child and younger brother of Venus, but its inhabitants are of their own kind, all sentient, complete beings, full septenary men or higher beings, are furnished in their beginnings with forms and organisms in full harmony and with the nature and state of the sphere they inhabit. And then the last part here. The informing intelligences which animate these various centers of being are referred to indiscriminately by men beyond the great range as the Manus, the Rishis, the Petris, the Prajapati, and so on, and as Dhyani Buddhas, the Chohans, Melhas, Fire Gods, Bodhisattvas, and others on this side. The truly ignorant call them gods, and the learned profane the one God. The wise, the initiates, honor them only in the manventeric manifestations of that which neither are creators, the Dian Chohans, nor their creatures can ever discuss or know anything about. The absolute is not to be defined, and no mortal or immortal has ever seen or comprehended it during the periods of existence. The mutable cannot know the immutable, nor can that which lives perceive absolute life. Therefore, man cannot know higher beings than his own progenitors, nor shall he worship them, but he ought to know how, he ought to learn how he came into this world. So, for next week, the Sunday um, discussion will be what, how, and why, the basis of Theosophia.